This is a film about Gardena, a suburb of Los Angeles, California, USA. It is the improbable tale of a city whose culture, people, and destiny changed all of America. It may be one of the world's most important small towns you've never heard of. This is its story, told by the people who lived it. Welcome to Freeway City. I came here and I found this uh, Guardian Boulevard by accident and I just fell in love with it. It, it was something like uh, Norman Rockwell would have painted and I moved here to Gardena about uh, 31, 32 years ago. I kind of liked the little downtown area. It kind of reminded me of little, little America. Or I just kind of fell in love with the community. And my dream was for Gardena to uh, be the entertainment capital of Southern California by us having the car clubs, commonly known as casinos today. This could have been another little Las Vegas, but in a different scale, of course. But that didn't happen. <laughs> The pre-war Gardena was a lot bigger than the current uh, jurisdiction that you see. It probably went as far east as Avalon Boulevard and far west as probably Crenshaw Boulevard. Far north, uh, probably north of El Segundo and certainly south of where we are now at 182nd. What you have uh, at that time was farming, wide open spaces. It was never really fully understood who was the true founder of Gardena. There was several other names thrown out there, Thorpe among others. And uh, although some of them were early pioneers, the true person was this fellow, Abram Pomeroy. This is the very first advertisement that Pomeroy used to market some of those Gardena tracks. It's actually dated from 1886, and it claims that the market will be uh, ready January 3rd, 1887. So you could make the case that that would be the founding date of Gardena in name and as a community. Go back a hundred years and it was a heavily agricultural area. They said, oh, this is such a beautiful, it's like a garden. They said, oh, well, this is a garden valley. And Gardena became Gardena Valley. There is one passage in an early article in the LA Times where it claims that the property in a few years will actually prove its name indeed appropriate slash Gardena. So the marketing of this tract for the production of fruit trees, agriculture, was synonymous with a garden. You know, we were incorporated in 1930. Even though Gardena is not that big of a, a city, I think that there is a certain amount of uh, prestige, power, and identity in just incorporating and having your own city. Gardena was a truck farm with a lot of Japanese truck farmers and dairies and chicken ranches, and that was about it. Most people had chickens. They had their own chickens. We had over 100 rabbits that I had to feed when I went to junior high school. I had to feed them before I could eat. On this lot here is where my dad had his vegetable garden. Grew all of our own vegetables. Over in this side, he had fruit trees. And on back, he had a greenhouse and uh, a chicken house. He was occupying the uh, place like, more like a family farm uh, for a, quite a few years. During World War II, he said that came in very handy, too, because you could trade your fruits and vegetables and eggs and so forth for things that were harder to get, like automobile tires and extra gas ration stamps and so forth. There was a lot of fear when World War II first started because we didn't know if we were going to be invaded living close to the coast here. They uh, had blackouts. I went to high school during World War II and it was, it was a scary time. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, our west coast became a potential combat zone. Living in that zone were more than 100,000 persons of Japanese ancestry, two-thirds of them American citizens. One-third aliens. I call them concentration camps. 
they call them relocation centers. It bothered me because it disrupted what I thought was the hardworking accomplishments of the Issei's, the parents. If it were not for the relocation, I think the Japanese Americans, through their farming, their flower industry, and other industries up and down the coast, would have wound up being one of the richest minorities in the United States. They took that away from us. There were like four or 5,000 people in Gardena in 1941. Um, maybe a little more than that, but about 2,200 Japanese Americans. I had a teacher tell me once she was at Gardena High School, junior, senior high, there were 700 students there, Japanese Americans, one day and gone the next. They had orphans in an orphanage in Los Angeles. One boy was a two-year-old, half Japanese, half American, taken to the camps because he was of Japanese descent and therefore somehow a threat to our country. Absurd. There were more Japanese in Los Angeles than in any other area. In nearby San Pedro, houses and hotels, occupied almost exclusively by Japanese, were within a stone throw of a naval air base, shipyards, oil wells. Japanese fishermen had every opportunity to watch the movement of our ships. Japanese farmers were living close to vital aircraft plants. They only had several days to move from their homes on Terminal Island and it was really a shameful sight because when I went down there, these people had the house full of furniture. They couldn't sell, they could only carry out certain things. And while I was there, the people that heard about their uh, having to leave would come down and offer ridiculous prices for all the furniture and personal possessions they had in their home. The authorities came and said, you guys are going to have to move, you're going to have to get out of here. And at one point, they gathered them all up, and I don't know, I guess they put them on buses from here. And some of them ended up at Santa Anita, and they housed them out there, which was, you know, not a very good place to house them, but they were, they were in between here and the places in Arizona and, and all the places where the relocation centers were. Santa Anita Racetrack, for example, suddenly became a community of about 17,000 persons. I went to the draft board. And I says, uh, uh, my friends have been in the army and uh, the war is on and I'm 1A. Can you tell me what uh, you're going to do about calling me into the service? They called me and said, Mr. Manai, you're going to be uh, reclassified from 1A to 4C. 4C is aliens ineligible for service. So I thought, well, gee whiz, I, I can't understand that. Uh, I'm third generation American, and uh, they won't take me into the service. Manzanar was a wartime camp established by the government that housed about 10,000 Japanese Americans. It's uh, a mile square. In each block, they had about 14 barracks. Each of the barracks were divided into about five apartments. There were 36 blocks. Each of the blocks may be held about 300 to 400 people. So they converted block seven into a high school. For block one, which was administrative, and then warehouses, and then the rest of the block for living quarters. And it also had a wartime uh, Guayuli plant that was experimental in producing rubber. I looked up and we were right under a guard tower. There was a uh, man with a uh, rifle or machine gun up on top, day and night. So I told myself, well, I can't stand this, I'm gonna have to get out of here. 
Well, after several months, they called me one time and said, we are forming labor battalions to go out to harvest produce because there's uh, farmers out there and can't get any labor during the war. The first unit was about 12 people and we were sent to Idaho and we harvested uh, sugar beets and uh, potatoes. It was a hard job, but at least I was out of camp and I was very happy. Well, a little bit later, I heard that they were going to have the full 42nd Regimental Combat Team it wasn't named that, but anyway, a Japanese American unit in uh, Camp Shelby, Mississippi. They sent down the 100th Infantry Battalion from McCoy, and then we started to get uh, uh, people that were in uh, different units throughout the United States, Japanese Americans, and then later on we got volunteers from camp. But we brought them into Camp Shelby, Mississippi, and started to train, and that was the start of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, which many people know became one of the most highly decorated units ever in the history of the United States military. They know what they're fighting against, and they know what they're fighting for, their country, and for the American ideals that are part of their upbringing. Democracy, freedom, equality of opportunity, regardless of race, creed, or ancestry. World War II changed everything in Gardena, from an agriculture, strictly agriculture, to urban tract houses. An entirely different group of people moved in. The attitudes changed. Uh, practically everything changed. <laughs> From here, I think you can understand. I'm flying over Houston, and baby, I'm ready to land. Proud to be a full-blooded American man. Gonna get in my car and drive along the new freeways. They can get me to work, to school, and to my girl, they say. Yes, I was born and raised. Southern California had a great thing. We also had the movies here. So we attracted all kinds of characters. And it was these characters that came back after the war. They had all this money. So then they bought these houses. Everybody was from back east. If you came across a native Californian, it was like a miracle. The people would get together for a neighborhood barbecue or visit, and they'd find out that uh, their neighbors were from Ohio or Indiana or Michigan or back east. That was the normal thing. You know, a lot of the homes were smaller homes. I think it's, you know, homes built in the 50s, uh, some in, in the 40s, post-war homes. So a lot of them were smaller, two bedrooms, one bath, three bedroom, one bath. And then I think in the 50s, you saw a lot of homes that were three bedroom, two bath. They sold for $9,995, which is unbelievable. Today, when I deal with some people, they say, I bought my home for $15,000, or I bought mine for thirty five, dollars and I kind of know about what year they bought it in. But you remember, I worked at Douglas and so did thousands of other people. 45 cents an hour, 47 and a half for swing shift, 50 cents for graveyard. Parking lots filled, 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 filled with, with people. people. This is the second house that I uh, lived in here in Gardena, right over here. We moved in here in 1953, bought it brand new for a cost of $12,000. Three bedroom house with a nice big backyard, a nice good sized front yard. You don't get those anymore. 
They build the houses almost touching these days, you know. This whole track consists of 59 homes. They were all built in 1952. Well, back in those days, it was all white, and uh, most of the mothers were home with the kids. Uh, the fathers were able to make enough money to make ends meet back in those days, unlike now, where if you don't have two incomes coming in, you don't make it. But back in these days, my dad's salary gross was $100 a week, and he probably got home after taxes and deductions with about $94, $95 of it. And out of that, he paid the house payment on the house, a car payment, supported a wife and three kids. They never went for anything. We, ought, we had everything we needed. You couldn't do that now with three or four times that much money. I think there were parts of Gardena or the local area where uh, it was sort of um, known that if you're not white, you don't buy there. And I think some of the realtors in the area, you know, supported that practice. I came down to 146th Street where they were building a housing tract and a realtor told me, he says, no, we cannot sell to you because we're going to keep the Japanese out of our housing. Well, I found out who the builder was, so I went to the builder, and I says, you know that this town of Gardena has always had a very strong population of Japanese, and I think that it's wrong to say that uh, you can't sell to Japanese. Well, the builder told me I didn't instruct that to the realtor, so will you go back and tell them that uh, whoever wants to buy can buy? So I went back to him, and the whole street, 146th Street and 145th, where the housing track was being built, eventually ended up, I would say, about 95% Japanese Americans. Well, it's interesting. If you take a look at the area, which is now Holly Park, there are not a lot of Americans of Japanese ancestry in that area. And the reason for that, they weren't allowed to buy in that area. And if you take a look at it also close to St. Anthony's, which was Old Town, downtown Gardena, Japanese uh, and others were uh, not encouraged to buy there. So for the most part, you will see west and south is where the Japanese American community ended up developing. Not only myself, but there were other people that opened real estate, Nakajima Company, Ken Nakaoka Company. We all decided to go into real estate business because we could serve the Japanese American community up until then, there were no Japanese realtors. You know, coming out of World War II, it's hard enough to save enough money to buy a house. And then to try to go out and buy a house and being told you can't live here, move on to somewhere else, is quite discouraging. And so you have to give the first and second generation Japanese Americans a lot of credit for just having the courage to hang in there and keep going. All of us went into the real estate business and it came out very well. We all succeeded in that. I think that kind of uh, convinced or showed all the realtors throughout California that uh, to uh, discriminate against any particular group of people is not the thing to do when you're selling real estate. My name is Tom Parks, and I've been in Gardena uh, off and on since 1946. And I went to work for the card clubs in Gardena in 1959. Uh, eventually became a partner in the uh, Horseshoe and the Gardena clubs. I left the Horseshoe Club to take over the Rainbow Club but with the open competition of other cities in the county, like the Bicycle Club and the Commerce Club and the Bell Gardens Club and so forth. We had to close it down. And, and, uh, went bankrupt in the summer of 83. At one time we had six card clubs in Gardena. It was the only city in the county that, uh, that had the card clubs. That Because of that, uh, the growth was limited. 
that department stores and restaurants, etc., wouldn't come into Gardena because of the card clubs. I'm Blaine Nicholson. I now live in San Diego, and I'm a retired advertising public relations executive. Arnie Prim was the owner of two of them, and he never did like to lose because he also had casinos in Reno. So he developed this idea that you could come there and play poker among friends, and every hour a chip girl would show up and would collect money from everybody who was there. He was never involved in the gambling. He was in a position that he never had to lose. It was all round tables. There was no dealers. You had chip girls that done everything. We served coffee, cigarettes, food, and you took collections every half hour. There was a light that came on on the, on the hour and the half hour, red light, and you had five minutes to get either get out of the seat or pay your collection to stay in the seat for the next half hour. Players would try to get up and kind of move around when the light came on so that they couldn't, they could avoid paying the fee. And um, the, the floor people and the managers used to have to track the players. It always tell the gamblers. They were always dressed kind of flamboyantly. From the outside, most of the people, whenever you mentioned Gardena, they thought it was a, a gambling town. They, they thought, that, I don't know, I guess they thought it was crime ridden Sin City or something. But the card clubs were very innoxious, and certain people, mostly from out of town, came and played cards there. And the local people mostly used it as a restaurant. They had the greatest meals in the world. I remember when we first moved here, they go, oh, you're moving to the city with all the casinos. And I just remember coming home sometimes, I would always ask, can we go down the streets with the casinos on them? Because just seeing the whole lights, it was like Vegas. I remember being on vacation. Uh, and several times, you know, when, when you meet someone on vacation, and they'd be talking to my parents or something would happen and say, oh, you're from Gardena, oh, the card clubs. And I heard that many, many times. Coming from an Italian family, and we would play all, always, uh, we had a poker game in the house with my mom, my dad, my mom was a, a cocktail waitress here in Gardena, and my dad was a truck driver for the Dr. Pepper and Squirt over here on Redondo Beach Boulevard. My mom knew everybody in Gardena. She knew all the bookies, she knew the chief of police, you know, she knew everybody. And uh, I remember as a kid, all those people coming over at our dining room table playing poker. A few of the more prosperous clubs opened right after the war. Fremen made a deal with the veterans organizations that he would, uh, he would give them the license and pay them so much a month. A veterans organization had to hold the license and then they had to lease it to the card clubs. They were paying pretty good money to the veterans organizations for the use of the license. And of course, it's, you know, right after the war, who's going to turn down the veterans? I've been in the casinos many times as a police officer. I've looked around the room and I see these people and they're just gambling their lives away. I've talked to people who go to my church, who work in there, and they tell me stories of these guys that'll just I mean, they mortgage their houses and they just, they lose everything. It's kind of like the saying goes, Vegas wasn't built on winners. You know what I'm saying? It's built on losers. And so it is with uh, the revenue that's collected from these, these clubs, you know, they're out to make money. And uh, someone goes in there and they want to blow their money to hopefully make more money. It's a gamble. That's why they call it gambling. I feel to each his own. If a person wants to gamble, they're going to gamble. If not on a table, they'll gamble in other ways. And I feel if that's what they want to do, that they should be allowed to do it. I think some of the things that kind of helped Gardena stay alive was uh, the card clubs. I think they really helped in the community. They helped us keep our property taxes down by paying for the trash. They made sure that everybody got fed at Christmas time. They had Christmas baskets they gave out. Didn't matter, you know, as long as they lived in Gardena. Vermont Avenue was the main thoroughfare at that time. People who drove down to Gardena drove down Vermont. And of course, that took them right by Prim's clubs, and he was the first clubs. So the first things they would do would drive into his place. Prim was a very smart man. Prim, of course, he owned the Vermonter Ray and the, and the Rainbow Club. And he decided he wanted another one. Business was great, you know, it was in the 50s. And the clubs were full just about every day and every night, jam-packed. And he decided he wanted to have another club. They were gonna build it right next to the, to the Rainbow, so there'd be the three clubs together, the Starlight, the Rainbow, and the Monterey. 
And of course, the rest of the clubs in town, they just went berserk. You know, they said that he's gonna take all of, all of the business up there with the three clubs. First thing you see when you come into Gardena down Vermont is those three clubs. None of the rest of the clubs will get any business. So they fought it tooth and nail. The other clubs in the city, under a guise of being a moral group, started passing a petition to put all the clubs out of business, which basically was unbelievable that they would do this to themselves. But they got it on the ballot, and then there was an election. During that election, Prim began to realize that it was going to be very difficult to operate this way. Somebody put a stick of dynamite in the Rainbow Club. The bomb was placed at the back door of the Rainbow. It blew out that door. Uh, that was on a night that the club was closed. So somebody knew that um, by putting that bomb there, they wouldn't injure anybody. It scared Prim to the point that he, he backed off and buried <laughs> the foundation and everything else that started the Starlight. Prim turned in his license for the Starlight Club, uh, stopped all construction on, a, including he'd put $600,000 into, into uh, the foundation and he just paved it over. That was when Prem decided to hire me to do the public relations. The casinos really controlled Gardena as far as the elections go. In the beginning, it was my opinion that the card clubs were controlling the government and the election of the people, and the people weren't being represented by their own selves, by the electorate. So in the beginning, I was with a group that was anti-card club. Ernie Prim was a very good businessman. Uh, he was a very good entrepreneur. And um, he could be very charming. Uh, he's the man who started Gardena. He was the instigator behind the building of the pool and getting all the other clubs to join in. He gave a lot of presents away to the elected council people. I remember when I first got elected, he sent me a big barrel of food and booze and everything, and I sent it back and said, no, I'm not accepting that. It's too much. A lot of times they had advertising on the table who to vote for, and I think it was pretty common knowledge that they tried to instruct all the employees on who to vote for because somebody was always trying to get rid of the clubs. Well, at that time, the approach was to try to get a vote to vote the card clubs out of the community. And one election, they came within, I think, 800 votes of doing that. I think they got the card clubs to take a different attitude about how, how they'd be uh, in the community. And they became more like business operators rather than trying to control all the elections. Ernie was from Texas. He came to Los Angeles as a young man, and he became part of the Los Angeles street scene. And that's when he got involved with opening up these casinos in LA. Where we're going right now is the original site of the first club in Gardena, which was called the Embassy Palace. It was started by Ernest Pram and Frankie Martin, and they brought along one of their employees, Russ Miller, in 1937. They had run a, uh, an illegal gambling place on Washington Boulevard above a coffin factory. So one night, a police captain came up, and apparently he was well known to everybody there. He said, I'd like to go in, and they said, okay. So he went in and everybody that was playing at the tables suddenly tried to get out because they thought they were being raided. When Mayor Shaw got voted out as mayor of Los Angeles and Bowen came in, they had a reform movement. So they shut down all the illegal gambling. And Prem and Martin and Miller decided to come to Gardena. They operated for, for quite a while before the Sheriff's Department came in and raided them, shut them down, along with the Gardena Police Department. The whole idea of uh, poker in California was that poker was not gambling. Poker was a game of skill. So they called the clubs clubs, card clubs, not casinos. I guess way back when the gold miners and everybody played poker, it was a game of skill, it wasn't so much a game of chance. They would allow the poker because it was a game of skill, but no other gambling. The old senators that wrote that original law didn't want to put themselves in a position where they couldn't play poker. 
And so they just left the word poker out. So all those years had listed every game you could possibly think of, craps and, and a roulette and et cetera, et cetera, but no poker. And that's when they decided to go to court and see if they couldn't get a judge to agree that playing the game of skill poker was legal, and they did win. After I first met Prem, he asked me to come up to Reno and see his club up there, which is the Privet Island. So I flew up there. When I arrived, I uh, met him. Then he had to go do some business, so he left me down in the casino. I thought if I had an account that was a shoe store, I'd go buy some shoes from him because they would be my account. So I'll go over to the crap table and I'll shoot some craps. You know, I thought that would make him happy. Well, when he saw me there, he looked down the pit and he says, uh, Nicholson, he says, you know, in horse racing, you can beat the race, but you can't beat the races. And here, you can't beat the odds. So don't even bother with it, he says. I don't want you gambling in my place. I said, I don't gamble, really. He says, that's good. Did you know Ernie Prim, Larry? Sure, I do. He fired me. Ernie Prim fired you? Fired the whole, everybody on the floor he fired. Boom, one time. Ernie or? Ernie Prim, the guy that went to the rug, you know? Gary is his son. Yeah. He fired. Fired everybody. I was the board man in 1969. Fired the whole floor. Ten minutes later, he goes back out. He said, look, you go do the crew. He didn't fight over. Ernie Prim was eccentric. Yeah. He used to be the king of the town, but there's no more kings no more. In the late 50s, uh, when there was real controversy in Gardena about whether they should continue the casinos or not, the Rainbow Monterey Clubs did a poll and found out the majority of people were opposed to casinos in Gardena, registered voters were. And so they decided they better do something to improve their public relations. So they published a magazine called Town Magazine, and it included, among other things, drawings for housewives for small appliances. They would also show council members that they wanted to feature. Lots of pictures of Gardena activities, Gardena kids. It was informative, a small mailer. And we also, as part of that promotion, we had a coupon that the citizens of Gardena that had children could send in to be a part of the Guarding the Fun Day Club, the children on their birthday were then invited to go to Disneyland, uh, completely free at the expense of the card clubs. They would give you ticket books and uh, a, a bus to go out there and a chip for a box lunch, and the kids were able to take one parent with them. That was great. Not long after they started that program, uh, the poll came out, they took another poll, and the great majority of people wanted to have card, card clubs in Gardena. So they, uh, they, they turned the thing around with that, uh, turned the tide with that kind of public relations effort. They had uh, quite a few nightclubs. The Colony Club was probably the most famous one, where they had some of the biggest burlesque shows. Strippers like Lily St. Sire and, and Brenda Starr. It was right around in the area there where that Gardena Electric and that car wash is, somewhere in that vicinity was the building. I remember the building being kind of an ugly brown, the kind of brown that you really wouldn't want to see on any building. And they had neon signs, round ones, one on each end of the building. The one on, as you're facing this way, the one on the left said stop, the one on the right said go, and they would come on and off alternately. And the inside was plush, just like any burlesque uh, uh, club at the time, and maybe even now. Uh, good seats and a nice stage and uh, well-behaved people. It was a pretty famous place. Kind of club, sort of a burlesque place, I don't know. I think we were just newly married and didn't have enough money. I couldn't go to a place like that, besides that my wife wouldn't let me. I remember we at like 12 years old, 11 years old, me and Billy Fields used to go to the back door and peek in on a hot summer night to see the Can Can Girls. I had many jobs when I was uh, going to college. One of them was driving a cab. So I drove a cab out of all these card clubs in Gardena. Well, I had a fare that took me to the Colony Club, so I sat outside the Colony Club. So two guys in, a, in suits came up and asked me, where can I get a girl? 
I said, I don't know where you can get a girl. I, I'm, I'm a cab driver. I don't, and I really didn't because I, I was busy studying my books and all I cared about was either study or affair. That's all I was interested in. They kept inquiring, inquiring. You, you know, you're a cab driver. You know where you. I said, no, I don't know where I can get a girl. So finally, after they took off, the other cab drivers came up and said, what, what do those guys want? And I said, well, they were looking for a girl. I told them I didn't know there was a girl. And they said, well, you're lucky because those two guys are vice squad. <laughs> so fortunately, had I known anything, I wouldn't be a lawyer today, probably. At that time, burlesque was uh, more of an art. Uh, maybe it's still the way now, but you didn't see too much nudity, let me put it that way, in public. You almost had to go to a burlesque show. This lady came out in a blue dress suit with gloves, did a per perfect, you know, got down to her slip and that was it. And it was beautiful. And I, you know, I'll never forget that, but that was, so they did have a good form of entertainment if you want to call it that way, but I was glad I got to see it. It was well advertised in the LA Times and the Herald. And it was a very busy place. It was one of the few bar burlesque places in, in uh, Los Angeles County. In the early 60s, Two topless and later one went bottomless. The bars opened up just uh, up the street a few blocks. The first King and the Barbary Coast. Well, when they could go in there and see the whole thing, they didn't want to come in here and see partially covered, so the burlesque kind of slowly died out, which is what happened to our six card clubs here in Gardena also. We had very few blacks in those days that played poker. The boss used to tell me, he said, if a black guy comes in here, put your name on the board. If he's not wearing a suit or a tie, don't call him. Floor man would say to the board man, you know, give me a, a two and four player. And uh, you'd call off the initial, you know what I mean? And if you called off that initial of that black guy, they didn't have a suit or tie and you were fired. <laughs> so it was predominantly Japanese and white. Uh, prior to 1965, uh, nobody else uh, would even think of moving into Gardena. That all changed though after the Watts riots. I was not unfamiliar with Watts at all. I knew the Watts Library, the fire station right next to it. My dad taught at Grape Street Elementary School, which is right in the heart of Watts. My mom taught at both 93rd and 99th Street schools. Even though I didn't live right there, they had lived there. And we had moved a little bit further south to Gardena. But even before we moved there, when we were a little closer in, I remember all those places. Six days of rioting in a Negro section of Los Angeles left behind scenes reminiscent of war-torn cities. We were just shocked and mortified and, and even afraid. I drove around the city car with a big rusty old 45 sitting in the seat. I covered the West Ride. I, w I was right in the middle. Nobody could stand still for any length of time. They had to keep moving. A couple of guys there were standing there and they poke them with their mayonnaise and they move. I mean, it was serious. Soldiers are very serious people. They follow orders pretty good. There was this feeling like, just go inside, sort of lock your doors and that. But you know, even as a child,
if the things I see on TV start happening on my block, the doors and the windows are not going to stop it. I think the closest that it got to here was probably Imperial and Vermont. They had GIs stationed there, a couple of Jeeps. A lot of the shops that would be on TV, I'm looking at TV and I'm watching shops burn. I know those shops. So it's like where my dad used to get his hair cut. Hey, 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 that's right over there. That's the hamburger stand over there. That's the taco stand. I actually was working at Century Boulevard across the street from Hollywood Park at a gas station when the riots were occurring. And never did I think that off of Century Boulevard there would be coming uh, these tanks down the middle of the street. And I saw that. It was close. Close enough to smell the fire, close enough for the ashes to still be dropping. But it was a very frightening experience for me as a child because it was one of the few times that I experienced in America what I think that people experience in many other countries and cultures now and have throughout time, which is anarchy. Anarchy is a very scary place. I remember a youngster on TV uh, uh, shouting on television uh, in an interview, and we're gonna come to Inglewood. Well, Inglewood uh, became, is now predominantly an African-American city, uh, although the Hispanic population is growing there now. But uh, at that time, it wasn't. Gardena was, was also not an African-American uh, city. I think that's what happened in Holly Park. I don't know what came first, the chicken or the egg, the school more boundaries and the Watts riot at the same time, and one thing led to another, and there became vacancies up there. So yeah, it, it, it kind of uprooted, uh, a lot of people even moved out of the areas. Uh, like Compton used to be all white. When the blacks started buying there, the whites all moved out. Same thing with Englewood. It used to be all white. They wouldn't accept the change, so they moved out other places. The white flight was just that white flight, <laughs> you know. They, they were young and old, they just backed up and left. Where, where did those people move to? Uh, or Orange County, my friends are in Westminster, but Orange County is a lot of Mexican people now. They're surrounded. <laughs> so, so to some of those people that hate other races, <laughs> they went to a worse situation than, <laughs> than they were here. We noticed as uh, at Washington High School, uh, Clay Junior High in the northern end, uh, just north of Gardena, began to have more and more minority, particularly uh, black kids or African-American kids. Uh, other parents began to try to find other schools for their kids. Apparently, many black people were frightened about what was happening, burn city, burn baby, burn and all that stuff. And I, I guess a lot of them moved out of Compton and Watts area and moved over there and bought these houses which were vacant. And besides that, the kids, the school situation was such that it wasn't according to the people who lived up there appropriate for their kids anymore. So more vacancies came up there and ultimately it evolved into a black community. I don't know, it was at least 20 years ago. I know my friend lived down the street. She became one of my very best friends. And they moved up to Newhall. Now she lives in Texas. And um, I had a, a, other friends that moved to the beach. And um, the people that I originally became friendly with, like next door, there was a couple, uh, Mary, I think, and Tony. And they moved. The irony was that Holly Park Crack in the early 50s when they first built it, had racial covenants, which became illegal in the, in the mid 50s. That's why there were very few Asian people here, it was like all white. I'm B. Bernstein, and I live in Gardena since the 50s. I'm the original homeowner, which is quite rare around here. I moved to Gardena because my husband worked for United Hardware, which is right off of El Segundo, very close. This is the house where I live. I uh, bought it when it was brand new over 50 years ago, and I still enjoy it. It's two bedrooms and, like they say, a den and two bathrooms, and uh, has nice cross ventilation, and I have lovely neighbors. When I first moved here, about half the people were Caucasians, and about one third were Jewish. And now I think I'm probably, uh, I know I'm the only Jew on the block, and maybe the only Jew in Gardena, but that's fine. Blockbusting uh, was done 
uh, by realtors who wanted to make money by selling a lot of houses. What they would do, they'd go to a neighborhood like the, uh, the probably white Holly Park neighborhood of Gardena, and they'd, they'd buy a house and put a black family in there. And then they'd go door to door in the neighborhood saying, blacks are moving in, you better sell now while you still have some value in your property because it's all gonna go down. Panicked people. And I mentioned one group of Jewish uh, families, 50 of them went to, families, went to out of town in one summer. They all sold their houses. It was all done in the early 70s. Uh, you know, it was kind of funny because I moved here in September 69. And I noticed in January of 70, uh, for sale signs started popping up like popcorn. And that was because of the fact if people put their homes up for sale in January, they were hoping they'd be sold by June, their kids was out of school, then they could move to wherever they were going. So it was a big turnover. It was a real big turnover in the first part of 70. I would say from 70 to 80, that's about the time when many blacks moved into Gardena and a lot of the, the whites moved out. There was a lot of white flight here. There was a lot of white flight. We had a song on our first album. It's called There Goes the Neighborhood. There goes the neighborhood, the whites are moving in, they'll bring their necks of kin. It was sort of a reverse role of um, possibly some or unwarranted or warranted apprehension that people had about black people moving into their neighborhoods. And then I was talking about uh, either re-gentrification or gentrification, however you look at it. The reverse of that, which was already starting to happen, I flipped it, you know, here, white people moving in the neighborhoods, oh my God, yeah, they're gonna mess everything up. <laughs> At one time it was called Amistore Avenue, later the name changed to Compton Boulevard, and when Compton got a bad reputation years later, the people of Gardena voted to change the name again, and. So now it's known as Marine Avenue. So that's kind of an evolution of the uh, names, changes on this street. It changes because of Compton, all the way down to the beach. It ended at Vermont, but they didn't want nothing to do with Compton, so they changed the name. All the cities, the beach cities, all the way down from here to there. Why they did, I, I just heard that they just didn't want nothing to do with that, just that name because of the blacks. You know, it's, it's amazing how we are the first city west of the Mississippi to start recognizing Dr. King's birthday. Well, Arthur Johnson was the first person to bring the program to Gardena in, I believe, 1972. I'm not sure the city was able to give him money, but I do remember him telling me some things that when he went to some of the business and asked if they would give him a donation so he could recognize this day and have a program or what have you. And some of the people gave him black shoe polish. And of course, I'm not sure what the black shoe polish represented, but I think it speaks for itself that they weren't interested in recognizing a black man's name for a holiday. Whenever someone asks me, uh, I never turn down an opportunity to, uh, to share Martin Luther King, my mentee. Uh, I didn't know him that well, but I did get a chance to meet him. So whenever I get a chance to share Dr. Martin Luther King with an audience, I always do. I dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners may be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream. I dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, and every hill and mountain will be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. Anyway, that's just a line or two. <laughs> when I moved here in 69, uh, this community was totally white. And now I would say that it is probably totally Hispanic and black. So things have, have really changed in the 40 years I've been here. There, there's been a great change in everything here. There have been major exoduses post the riots. They were, they were already happening, but the riots made them go like, poof, like the big bang of exodus. I remember my dad used to say to me when we'd drive on the Harbor Freeway, 
He would say that if they gave the city to black people and other minorities, we were talking about black people in particular, and he's a black man talking, he said, if they gave us the city tomorrow with the keys, it'd fall apart in a week because we don't know how to do it. We, we don't know how to run a city like that. We don't, we haven't been educated and involved enough in the process for us to be able to truly man the post and do the jobs. The city has changed and it is ever changing. As you know, we have a large uh, apartment population. You can go up in certain sections of our city where there's lots of apartments and they're rental apartments. And the people that live in these apartments, whether they want to live there or not, isn't the issue. The fact is, is that the way they care for themselves in the apartments is very evident that there's not a lot of pride. They can, it's almost like a, a mentality that is impoverished. Okay, well you mix that kind of a thinker with a person that wants to own, there's gonna be a little bit of a, a tension so the walls go up, literally gates and walls. It's hard nowadays, you know, renting alone is, is hard, so. But uh, there's people out there just saving you know, nickels and dimes to, to get the American dream. My parents came from Zacatecas, Mexico. My dad moved over when he was three. They lived up uh, what they call La Loma, which is now Dominguez Hills, until my grandma had enough money to buy some property. She found a lot to farm. It was 10 acres. There was a house there when they bought the property, built in 1929. As they were building freeways in the Hollywood area, they bought a house from Beverly Hills and moved it down down to the Guardian Boulevard. It was fun, uh, you know, farming, uh, feeding the cows and all that. I've always been involved in the community. The city had a uh, teen post while the uh, kids were okay, but a lot of gang members originated from that little gathering, <laughs> you know. And I knew, I knew a lot of them. I still see some of them, they're adults now, they have good jobs and everything, but at that time they, they, were, <laughs> they were pretty bad. Some people say these kids are at risk, kids, let's throw the book to them, you know, before they do anything, whatever, lock them up or whatever. And other people say, well, let's help them, put them on a straight road. So that was uh, apparent there at the team post. They looked out after us, even as gang members. They still, they watched over us. I sort of almost skipped the gang thing. Not that it wasn't happening, but I just wasn't, I didn't want any parts of that. The bus boys started as Brian and Thangs. And I started the band at Gardena in high school. And I remember when I used to walk through the neighborhoods of Gardena and Carson, nothing could fascinate me more and still fascinates me than to see a good garage band. And I mean literally a garage band. You, they have the garage open and they're playing. I could stay for hours, you know, get some soda, some potato chips, and sit and listen to a garage band rehearse their songs and do that. And that was both before I started Brian and Things and during it, we became a garage band. I still think of us as a garage band. Um, we just rehearse in more expensive garages now. There used to be a group of people that had car clubs and they would give these dances. They'd rent these rooms at a hotel and they would put up these posters all over the city. I mean, Gardena was famous for having all these posters all long before I started seeing them through greater Los Angeles. There'd be these, up on all the telephone poles, these posters. And a lot of times they would have the name of a, a record. So that, that would be the name of the dance and say, Sly Slick and the Wicked, uh, July 27th at the Proud Bird. 
featuring Brian and Thangs, Be There, you know, this whole type thing, right? And so these were the type of events that we cut our teeth on. I don't think my father was very philosophical. I kind of remember him just wanting to do something to help people. I think he felt the city had a lot of potential and the city's going to change, it's going to grow. We could either try to control it the best we can to make the best city or just sit back and watch things happen. When the Japanese uh, businesses first came, Honda was at the end of uh, Gardena Boulevard. Nissan and the rest, they all had little branches nearby. I'm sure they would have located in Gardena if there were land available. But most of the land was available in the industrial section of Torrance, which happens to be off of 190th. And in that area, they were able to establish their uh, formal structures and headquarters and businesses. But the reason they came originally was that Gardena provided institutional infrastructure, schools, markets, housing, educational systems in terms of Japanese language for their children, as well as cultural events. And it became really like another prefecture of Japan, but located in the United States. The opposition was so much still going on as far as other locations are concerned, especially the fact that the input of the of Japanese imports taking jobs from the Americans. So they needed to be in an area where they were welcome. I'm still amazed that Toyota overtook General Motors. I never thought it would happen in a million years. I mean, Detroit and Flint was General Motors. The General Motors lived and died. Flint and Detroit lived and died. And uh, we, could, we, we just couldn't, you know, Toyota's never going to catch up. Kia, what the hell is that? Honda? Honda? That John, that's the name of John, Rain, John Wayne movie. Big Hondo, Honcho or something. We didn't know. Now, what am I driving? Honda. I was involved with the beginning of the Toyota company because I was the first auditors. The first automobile, the Toyota, was a passenger car and it didn't have the power, no guts. So I told the staff there, the management, I says, I bought one of your Toyota pets for my wife and she drives the kids around and I won't have her go on the freeway because you can't gas that up to get the speed up. Eventually, you can roll it up, but you gotta keep pressing the accelerator and I says, it's too dangerous. I got her out of that Toyota because it's not a car for Southern California. They were smart in cutting out the sales. And then the next car that came out with the Corona, a smaller car, more power, and that hit the market and sold. They found out in their research that whatever hit Southern California and could sell, you could sell throughout the country. Southern Cal was a market to prove it. The company that I helped more than any other was Honda Company. They would bring their uh, cars in on the ship and they said, well, we will unload. As soon as we unload, we need things to load up right away. We don't want the ships waiting there, but we got to go back to Japan and pick up more of our Hondas and bring them here. They had no manufacturing here. What I did is I started to put in cattle. So I would get cattle from all through Montana, Wyoming, everywhere. As soon as the ship was unloaded and the Hondas were unloaded, we could just shoe the cattle off. So Honda then became in the biggest beef importers and meat producers in Japan. Well, what happened is that when they cleaned these ships in Japan, Honda, not knowing it, became the biggest fertilizer company in Japan. <laughs> I think a lot of people had helped the Japanese companies coming over here uh, figure out how our society works. And I think that was a great help to them. And I remember back in the 60s and 70s, my father helped a lot of these companies because he had the ability to not only speak the language, but to read and write the language. Uh, he was able to help a lot of these people through his real estate business find locations. And of course, my dad, just liking Gardena, he was able to explain to them the pluses of, of the South Bay. 
The banks in Gardena, when I was the mayor, had a billion dollars on deposit, which is far more than the city of Torrance, four times our size. Why? Because you had a Honda, you had the Toyota, not just the dealerships, you had the headquarters buildings. Whether it's uh, Sumitomo Bank, as well as Mitsubishi Bank and others, uh, those kinds of banks uh, came because the business were here. Bank of Tokyo came in and that was rather strange. Uh, of course, again, when you're talking to me, I have World War II memories. I remember a lady called up on the telephone once and was taking a survey about Mitsubishi um, and Sony and what kind of television set do you have and everything else. And she said something about Mitsubishi and I told her, I said, good thing I didn't have the FBI after me. Last time I heard of Mitsubishi, I would have shot at it with my 50 caliber because we were, you know, we had airplane recognition and we were taught, you know, how to recognize at one hundredth of a second a Mitsubishi and a zero and a this and a that. Well, in the 50s and 60s and maybe early 70s, it was very few Asian signs. And then 70s, kind of saw both signs. And then in the 80s and 90s, uh, a lot of Asian signs without any accompanying English signs. I think it probably was some of this business about wanting to become more American, you know, get away from this Second World War attitude. I don't think anybody would have wanted to put up a sign in Japanese in the first 10 or 15 years after the Second World War. I believe a lot of Niseis did feel like second-class citizens. I remember when I was growing up that they wanted to be as American as possible. That's why, it, culturally, I think it, it hurt a lot of Japanese Americans because many third generation people don't speak the language at all. Where I think if you look at other cultures, the language and more the culture and customs is carried through to the fourth, fifth generation. And the Japanese American culture has assimilated into American society at a much faster rate. In 1972, Reagan decided to run for governor of California after he got elected. He called me one day and he said, you know, Paul, the assemblyman in your district passed away and I'm going to have a special election to fill that seat. Now, knowing that you're a Republican in a Democratic area, I'd like to have you run. He came down and raised money for me and campaigned for me. And as a result, I was elected to the assembly seat in uh, 1973. I was speaking on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce up in Sacramento, and a lady came out from the kitchen and said, you have a call from Washington, D.C. It was Joan Bernstein, and she was running a committee called the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians. And she says, Mr. Manai, there's a lot of people said that you might be able to help us so I says, Joan, I will sign up to be the executive director to help you get the hearings underway. And so I feel that I did do something in my lifetime to try to help all of us who were put into camp. And with reparations and an apology, that was a, a good thing. Here in California, in the primary tomorrow, people have the rare and no doubt pleasing opportunity to vote their taxes down, to tell the politicians that they will pay this much and no more. Proposition 13, it's called, and it's an absolute flat ban on how much property tax they can charge homeowners. Prop 13 was a godsend to anybody who owned their own home and wished to keep it. Taxes were going up like crazy. Well, it was good for the for the individual, but it didn't help the city coffers very much. Several cities who were having trouble at that time because of the change in the tax situation, they were not able to raise property taxes the way they had in the past, and so they needed money. And so they began to license these card clubs. Bell Gardens and Commerce built large casinos near the freeways, extremely successful. And then you saw casinos being built at, uh, in Hollywood Park and, and Inglewood and uh, down in Hawaiian Gardens and, and Compton and so on. And every time they built one, it seemed like another Gardena casino would fold the competition. Why? Because the people from that area of the county was now, were now going to those area casinos, the newer and nicer ones, than, than coming to Gardena. And that's when it started really hurting Gardena because they opened the clubs, they allowed liquor, they allowed high limit games, and Gardena was still stuck. And they changed the law and the ordinances later, but it was too late. All the customers had already left.
Fukai, Fukai was a fair-minded guy. He was a, he was a straight shooter. Developers knew to come to Moss if they wanted to come into Gardena. He was extremely effective. A lot of people just worshipped the man because of certain programs that he started and what he meant to the community of Gardena. Moss came up with the idea of having this insurance company, municipal mutual insurance company. We were told we were going to have $50 million in premiums in five years. I had a couple of insurance agents in Gardena tell me it was a bad deal. I should have listened to them. They expected other cities pay their premiums to our insurance company, but we couldn't get as many customers from other cities as they thought they could get. The biggest mistake I made and that we made as a council is causing that indebtedness. That put Gardena way in debt. It's tough to break into the insurance business, especially with big liability insurance. It went broke. We're at the Normandy Casino, one of the two casinos remaining in Gardena. The other is the Hustler Casino, uh, owned by Larry Flint. He bought it uh, from a bankruptcy court uh, when the Eldorado went out of business, and uh, Larry Flint uh, had the best bid paid the back taxes and so on and built his casino called The Hustler. The, it was the Embassy Club, um, which was owned by a fellow by the name of Harry Classman, and he went bankrupt. He used to skim the place like crazy. Then the late George Anthony bought it and uh, tore it down and built his El Dorado Club on that site. The El Dorado Restaurant, members of the Poker and Pan Casino Association of Gardena, welcomes you to Gardena. George got Alzheimer's and uh, he went bankrupt. That property was vacant for a number of years and uh, there were thoughts of doing different things there. One time I heard of a hotel, a very nice high-rise hotel. It was going bankrupt. The bankruptcy court owed the city a million dollars in taxes. That's how Larry Flint bought it. Uh, tore it down and built a new casino called the Hustler Casino. I just wanted to have a casino where I could make a few bucks and be able to play, play in a friendly card game with friends, you know? Well, there was a lot of objection to the name Hustler because of the magazine. It was used for the airplane, the B-58 Hustler. No one seemed to care about that. And our attorney, the city attorney, told us we couldn't uh, force him to change the name. They said that that denoted a um, male prostitute. If you look at Webster Dictionary, it just said that Hustler is an aggressive person, you know. And I didn't object to it because I liked him. I liked him because he believed in free speech and he, he uh, did what he had to do or what he felt was appropriate and he was, unfortunately, he was, he was wounded. I believed what he believes in free speech, no matter what it is. And then we thought uh, in the negotiations of developing and tearing down the old and developing the new, that it would have, say, maybe the new El Dorado Club. That was our understanding. Well, he switched on us with his, his own name. <laughs> At one council meeting, I was there, and that was, they were discussing that. <laughs> and this councilman took out Hustler magazine. He didn't put it on camera, but he took it out, and he said, this is so in so many words, the kind of trash we're going to get here. I was there. I actually went to the hearing. I opposed the, the Hustler Casino. I presented documentation from organizations like Focus on the Family, which are pro-family council, and some other things about what happens when you you bring gambling casinos into a community. Larry Flint's attorney met with our ministerial association. He, uh, being a liberal Jew, us being conservative Christians, that made for a really unique dialogue, but everybody was professional and cool and everything. But at the bottom line, you can just see real quick, this guy's coming in. The city wants him, he's gonna give us some great revenue, it's gonna help everybody, it's gonna be positive. They're trying to go back to that original luster of where we, where we came from and so forth. What I saw when I did visit the casinos in Southern California is they're primarily card clubs, and they did not have much pizzazz to them. I wanted to create the decor that uh, gamblers were used to seeing when they went to Las Vegas. The Hustler name brand is very attractive to young people and young gamblers, and they've almost created this uh, 
new breed of gamblers there. It's not the old poker style gamblers from Gardena. It's not that traditional crowd. It's this new young crowd that they've created on their own. The best thing that could have ever happened to us was to start showing the poker tournaments on television because that just drove these people in our doors who, it was fine to play online, but they wanted to go you know, playing a live game. And uh, I think that's been a, been a big boon, not just for me, but uh, to the other casinos as well. According to the reports that I see, you have occasional robberies, some home break-ins. More of them have a tendency to be gang-related. And it's unfortunate because gangs was not one of those things that when I was growing up here in the 50s, that was a major issue. Murder was most unusual. I remember in the 60s, we wouldn't lock the car doors. Of course, I think those type of things changed in the 70s when our society just became more sophisticated. The gangs, what few of them there were in the 60s, they used to go behind the old Taco Bell and fight with chains and knives. They never carried firearms, never shot each other. They cut each other, beat each other up with chains, but they didn't use firearms. So things, we were safer then. Like nowadays, people drive by and shoot into a building, aiming at somebody and hit some poor kid. It happens all the time. Well, at the time, it was all just, you're in my neighborhood. You know, if you're not from my neighborhood, then you don't belong here. Locals only. And then it just got worse and worse. You know, somebody got killed, and they just go back and forth. The gang members of the day, they kind of re revered them old guys, you know, like, you know, they're gods or something. Uh, so they're quite well respected among their peers and their counterparts of today. But their counterparts of today are much more violent and do more harm to the general public than the gangs of yesterday. Well, I am aware that there is a gang problem here. I mean, you see taggings on the freeway, on the highway, uh, on the walls of some buildings uh, before the city can get to them to paint over them. But I don't think that the problem here is any, any greater than any other community of the same socioeconomic level. We have uh, two major uh, gangs in Gardena. One is the Shock and Crips, which controls the north end of our city. And then from the middle part to the south end of our city, we have a Hispanic street gang called G13, Gardena 13. Those are the two big gangs in Gardena. Gardena 13 is a little bit more pushed out of our area, and it's not as predominant in the Gardena city limits, but they are in the uh, LA Strip of Gardena, which is east of Vermont. Is there an apartment number? This is a lot of where the Gardena 13 guys live. It doesn't specify a unit number. A lot of them live like, in these apartments right here. We've congregated along this, this block here. Mm -hmm. This whole area is really I, would, I would say it's kind of like the heart of where the majority of them are living right now. Gang members are identified a lot of different ways. Obviously, you know, if they self-admit, that's one great way of identifying. Are you a gang member? Yeah, I am. Okay, well, you're a gang member. You self-admitted that. Way. You know, a lot of times clothing, although that's not as apparent as anymore. People don't dress down like they used to as, you know, dressing the part of a gang member. It's just common between the Hispanics and the blacks. They both wear uh, green. They call it Gardena green. That's from the, the high school. The high school colors uh, are green. They have green in their colors. Most of the tattoos say G13 in one form or fashion. That can be written out in a lot of different ways. It can be with the letter G and, you know, the numbers 1, 3, G13. It could be Roman numerals. It could be, you know, sewer 13, that's South 13. That's not necessarily identifying them as a G13er, but, you know, that's involving them in, in uh, the South uh, gang lines. What is there, apartment number? It doesn't specify a unit number. There were certain neighborhoods that we just didn't get along with. Down the street, which is the T Flats, that's been going on since before I was even from the neighborhood. Probably late 60s or 70s. Well, I belong to a Los Santos club, which I still have my club jacket, and every now and then we'd have a car wash to, to buy our the club jackets. I got shot in this jacket. This is the name of our club. 
and uh, we wanted to put something on the back and the main hangout for so many years since the 60s was Gardena Boulevard in Ainsworth. The guy who made the jackets, uh, we took a photo of the of the corner and uh, this is what he came up with. It's basically a homie kicking it on the corner. This guy on the top, Los Santos. Los Santos means the saints. Not too long ago, this painting right here had a bunch of uh, graffiti on it. And people, they, they, a lot of, they put down people that had passed away. We'd be at a funeral, somebody got, maybe got killed. Like the first guy that got killed from my neighborhood he got beat down with a, with a two by four. I know most of them, they got killed. They recently killed uh, one of my buddies, uh, standing on Gardena Boulevard with his back against the boulevard. And then and they hit him up. Turned around and they shot him. It was uh, mainly fist fighting. Uh, there were no guns. And this was in the early 70s. Once in a while, you know, somebody pull out a knife. Then there'd be like uh, the first drive-bys. Just you just see all the bullet holes, boom, 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 boom. It was just an evening, and I hear pop, pop, pop over on the corner, and I recognize it as gunshots. And I hear cling, cling. It sounds like cartridges bouncing off the cement. And without thinking, I said to Loretta, I said. Hit the deck, Loretta. I said, somebody's out there shooting. I don't know who they were shooting at. So I heard the car screech around the corner, and I came outside, and I didn't see anything. And the next morning, I came out, and one of the neighbors over here said he heard the cars screeching around the corner. And I was looking around out in front of the house, and I see a couple of cartridges laying on the front lawn by the sidewalk. And I look at the stucco real carefully by the window, and there's a chip of concrete, a um, chip of stucco, right just a couple of inches below the window ledge. And we had been walking through the living room. That bullet could have come through the glass and got one of us. So it was a drive-by. They didn't care. They didn't care who got shot. And to tell you the truth, that pissed me off. I had a saxophone player. He used to teach in Gardena, HB. And HB was a white guy. And he came to play sax and Brian and things. And we were laughing one night out in the garage talking crap. And I said, yeah, HB. Yeah, we, you sh we show you how we, we do it when you come to the ghetto. He said, stop. <laughs> I want to let you know. <laughs> this is not the ghetto. <laughs> you may have heard that on a Donny Hathaway song, but this is not it. These are nice, middle-class American homes. Your parents are teachers. You have a station wagon to haul your van around and a garage to hang out in. This is not the ghetto. <laughs> I think this city has a bright future. I think we will continue to grow. I don't see any skyscrapers coming into Gardena in the next 10 to 15 years, to my knowledge. But I do see a continued upgrading of the homes, the community. I see all of those things as being positive for the city. I really see um, new businesses coming here. I think that's what's going to change Gardena. It's going to completely turn the city around. We're freeway accessible. We're in between the 405, the 105 the 110 and the 91. Not many cities can say that. I thought my time at Gardena and my living in the Carson Gardena area was helpful, formative, and good for me because the neighborhood and the people and the things there were supporting. Positive environments where people basically give you the thumbs up for what your aspirations are in life. Those are the things that are most important. I think, for the formation of anybody's life, whatever it is you're into. Through life, you should always look at trying to help people, and you will benefit from that. So don't ever remember anything else, but anything to help the people will be a benefit to you. So I go through life that way. History tells us that towns go boom, bust and boom again and only time will tell the future of Gardena. The 
the city of Los Angeles would never, or any major city would never allow a racetrack to be built in the middle of its proper area. Um, they just wouldn't be able to get a, a release. There, you know, there's too many people too close. Ascot was here before the area was developed around it. And that's why Ascot was here. Ascot was here in 57. There was nothing around here. There was there were very few houses. And in those days, it didn't matter if there were houses around. We're building a racetrack. We're going to go race, and it didn't matter. Nowadays, it's quite different. When you saw Ascot Park, you saw the name, and you saw a couple of palm trees next to it, you knew Ascot Park was Southern California, and you knew that it was one of the best places to race in the country. There was a guy named Evil Knievel out of Butte, Montana, that knew this. He knew not only the top open wheel racing was here and nationally televised, he knew some of the top national championship motorcycle races were here. So Evil made it his business to try and get on television. In fact, his first televised jump was during one of J.C. Agajanian's national championship races, and it was right here behind that light pole. The track is located in Gardena on Vermont at about 182nd Street. We brought a lot of fame to the city of Gardena and it was our pleasure to do that. And our last race was on Thanksgiving night, 1990. I was there and it was a very sad evening. There were a lot of racers and fans that didn't want to leave this property because they didn't want Ascot to be over. You know, there'll never be another Ascot and there'll never be another Ascot because it was in the middle of the city. In fact, Ascot was where the harbor, the San Diego and the 91 freeways explode. That's what we used to say on the commercials and, and it was true. Three main freeways, a half mile racetrack in the middle of the city, it'll never happen again.